Good morning. How are you guys? Two dim-witted golfers went out and played golf in the fog. And they were having some trouble, but they got to one hole where they could see the flag sticking out above the fog, but they couldn't see the hole. And they said, well, we're going to play this one through anyway. So they, they hit their balls, and the balls went sailing, and it disappeared into the foggy soup. And they said, well, we're gonna, now we've got to go look for them. So they went heading towards where the flag was. They knew they kind of hit the balls in that direction. And they found that ball one was about six feet away from where the hole was. And ball two actually made it a hole in one. And so they got looking at it and they said, you know what? Who, who hit what? They said, we don't know who hit what. So they got thinking about it and they knew there was a professional golfer that was on, on the uh, green. And so they went to him to help them answer their question as to who got the hole in one and who had to hit the ball one more time. And the professional golfer came up and he said, well, who has the orange ball? <laughs> I don't call that a ba-dump bump, so I won't be doing that one. But uh, anyway, I hope that you all are doing well. And you know what? I didn't bring I hope you're doing well. There are some announcements out there. I'm starting my vacation uh, tomorrow officially when I get on the plane going to Amsterdam at about 9.30. So uh, keep, keep me in your prayers. There are some times where I'm going to be over there by myself. I'm a little bit nervous about that, but uh, for the most part, I am just trusting in God that it's going to be a good time and, and that he's going to protect me. But uh, I appreciate all your well wishes and your concern and support that you've given me over that. Uh, it's, it's greatly appreciated. Um, but I will be gone till the 19th. I'm coming back on the 16th. I think it is in here in the bulletin. Uh, yeah, Pastor Rob Nystrom is the emergency on call. His number is there. If you need to talk to him, uh, if there's a funeral that comes up or somebody has to have an emergency wedding, um, just uh, feel free to give him a call. And um, he said he would be willing to do that. Um, but it's just for emergencies. Nothing, you know, no, no plumbing emergencies, no, you know, house on fire, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, you understand what I'm trying to tell you. But you can call me again on the 16th. I will be, even though I'm officially on vacation, um, I'll be back in the States. One of the things that I didn't know until I made this trip, that when you go to a foreign country like Italy, you have to buy an Italian cell phone. Otherwise, when you make phone calls over there, you've got roaming charges. And that's not really a joke because the first time I said it, it was Roman charges. And no, it's not Roman charges, it's roaming charges. So... Um, so that's, that's the thing. When I will not be able to be able to be contacted because my phone will not be on for most of the trip. Uh, but I will be back on the 16th. You can call me again on the 16th if you need to. Um, governance meeting is this Tuesday. Uh, I hope that you have a good governance meeting. Don't vote me out while I'm gone. Um, there is also the... Uh, United Methodist Women Rummage Sale, um, that is going this week. Is there more information about that? The ladies' meeting will be Thursday. Okay. 10 o'clock instead of Tuesday. <coughs> Thursday at 10 o'clock? Yes, and that's when we'll start setting everything up as well. And what are the hours for the rummage sale? Saturday, 9 to 3. Saturday, 9 to 3. Okay. And um, next week, we're having uh, Eric Johnson is going to be subbing for me. And the week after that, it's going to be uh, Doug Bliss. He's not a pastor. He's a lay uh, speaker. So uh, I appreciate you coming and supporting them while they're here. Um, 
I'm not sure what the cookies are. Oh, the children's church, children's church uh, resumes. So they're going to have uh, bring in school supplies in exchange for cookies. Oh, okay. So bring in cookies is what so I'm hearing. Bring in school supplies. Oh, bring in school supplies. Okay. In exchange for the cookies. Okay. Um, I brought in like several notebooks out there. Can I get cookies in advance? We'll have to work on it. Okay. Um, be aware also that we do have the boxes out there. There's different things that could be used for different ministries that we're involved in, um, school veteran veterans, um, different ones. So uh, if, you, if you have something that you'd like to donate, look at those boxes that are sitting out into the fellowship hall uh, and support the church in those ways, and we will make sure that those things get to where they need to get to. The rest of these are announcements that can be saved for later. Um, they're on your bulletin on this page if you'd like to look at them. Um, and then we have birthdays. <coughs> uh, yes. Yes. Yep, yep. And you know, everybody knows how to get to your house? They can ask. They should. They should. If you don't know, they're over there. You can find them. Yes? Um, it is... So anything that's school supply, hand sanitizer, notebooks, pencils, pens, anything like that. Um, Kleenex, uh, that's something you wouldn't think of as school supplies, but um, I know I brought in some Kleenex back there because I know that's something that they need. So um, if you bring it in, you get cookies. That's so whatever you bring in, they're going to they're gonna be able to use. Yeah. School supplies. One day back, Sally. <laughs> one day back. No, 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 you're good, you're good. Um, there is uh, uh, the uh, birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, Shailene, you have a birthday. What was it, two days ago? Happy birthday to you. And Daryl, I don't know if you're listening, but you had a birthday today. Are you having a birthday today? Um, and then the rest we can save for later. So let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you, and many more, despite what Rick says. <laughs> He's already in trouble. I didn't think I was putting you any deeper. Just... Um, and Bob and Mickey, we're going to celebrate yours just because I want to do it before I go. Okay. So happy anniversary to you, happy anniversary to you, happy anniversary, God bless you, happy anniversary to you, and many more. And let Mickey know that we thought of her today as well. How is she doing, by the way? About the same. About the same? It's a slow recovery on this, huh? Uh, that said, I will let Russ take over. Good morning and welcome to Sprout United Methodist Church. I'm Russ Robel, and if you could please stand as you're able and join me to, in the call to worship. I will read the light print if you could please respond with the bold print. In the presence of God we gather. Like little children, we surround God. Hoping for that touch which will refresh us, longing to be embraced in arms of love. 
We look and find a feast has been prepared for us. And you may be seated. And if the choir could please join me up here. Now, if you stand, if you're able, it's 593, Here I Am, Lord. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in tears. Sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? I will break their hearts of stone, give them heart for love alone. 
I will speak my word to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord of wind and flame, I will tend the poor and lame. I will set a feast for them. My hand will save. Finest bread I will provide till their hearts be satisfied I will give my life to them whom shall I send here I am Lord and this is I Lord I have heard you calling I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will go, Lord, in my heart. You may be seated. We have prayer requests out there this morning. No talking, Bob. This is not your time. I'm picking on you. <laughs> I hope you can take that. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oops. Yes. I have a neighbor in on Joyce that I'd like to have remembered in prayer. Okay. <coughs> Sandy. What? <laughs> Sally. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope I don't get so confused I bring in a third name. <laughs> yes. That being said, I think last week or the week before I had said something about that uh, Hillman Haven was within weeks of being closed because of not getting any help. Well, last I heard, they hired two or three people, which brought them back from the brink of closing. So, and that would have affected a couple of my Hillman people. So, um, not the, to lessen what you said at all, but it, it just testifies to how troubling things are right now. We have some, uh, we have some ads out there right now that have gotten to applications, so we're just praying that some of those people will fit the bill and we'll get that. Yeah. Yes. For Frankie, please. Mm -hmm. He's just not giving up the fight. Any others? Yes. Our neighbor Bruce. Keep 
keep me in your prayers. Um, I ask that you keep Luke and Pippin in the prayers. Uh, there has been a stray neighborhood cat that has had a flea jump on me and then it jumped on them and now they're, they're dealing with fleas and I'm having to leave that with Renee. So be praying for Renee as well. <laughs> She's gonna have to take care of my flea bitten cats. So, um, and, and we're on the road to recovery. I've got them with stuff on them and, and all of that. So just, just and I am 99% sure I'm flea free. So you can shake hands with me without fear of getting a hitchhiker. So, any other prayer requests? Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, I thank you for your presence here this morning. I pray that you be with each request, that you bless them and that you care for them and be the God that you have always been for them that you continue to work in the issues that, are, that they're having to face, whatever they may be, medical, traveling, um, recovering, whatever it is, dear Lord, we ask that you be with them. We ask that you be with the country and the, the world that are places that are dealing with fires, um, floods, and even places where they're having inadequate water supply and power supplies. And, and uh, that kind of thing, dear Lord, we ask that you be with them as well, that you bless them and help them through, see them through this time. We thank you, dear Lord, that you are a God that's much bigger than anything that is, that could be on our plate. And we just ask that you be with us as we deal with these things that are, uh, that are, that we're having to deal with. We thank you, dear Lord, and you, in you that we uh, give all of these things. Amen. Now for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Today's reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 6 through 11, and this is the New International Version. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and the bread for the, wa the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I don't know much about the book of Isaiah. I'm going to just tell you that right now. There's when you look through the Bible and you talk about the things that you spend a lot of time with, um, I think we spend a lot of time in the books of Genesis and Exodus because those are interesting books. And then we might, as we flip through, we might stop off at Ruth and read the story of Ruth 
And then maybe the, the Psalms and the Proverbs will hit that every once in a while. But then we skip all the way. Uh, I know I've, I stop off every once in a while to read Ecclesiastes um, just because I like that book. But not, that's not a book for everyone. And then it's the New Testament. And then that's where a lot of things, we, we spend a lot of time. But these things that are the, in the middle of the Bible that come after uh, Psalms and Proverbs, those books of prophet, those are hard to get into for me. And I just do not know very much about them. But when I saw that this scripture from Isaiah 55 I said, I need to know more about the book of Isaiah because when you do hear about the book of Isaiah, you hear it in quotes that come from the New Testament and people like to quote from it an awful lot, but we don't know a lot about it. And as you know, I like to tell you a little bit about what I discover as I learn things because that's part of who I am is being a teacher. I know that there is 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah, um, and the book was not written in one standing. There was three sections in it, and they were written at different parts in Israel's life, or Isaiah's life. I'm going to confuse those two. So see, Sally, I, it's not just you. Um, so if you hear me say Israel, and I'm talking about a book, it's Isaiah. Isaiah is written in three parts. And this chapter 55 is at the end of the second part. And we know that the first part was written early in Isaiah's life. And then the second part was around that he had been a prophet for a while. And <clears throat> Israel, Judah, was going through some changes at that particular point. As for the history of the Israelites when this book was being written... I do know that it was after King David and King Solomon when Israel was at its height. It was one nation under God, so to speak. But there came a time when Israel split into Judah and what was left of Israel, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And as you know, in the northern kingdom, there were... Many kings, and many of them were evil. In fact, I think they all were evil. Not so in the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom, Judah had a familial line that came from David, and they, some of them were good, and some of them not so good. In the north, the kings led the nation like like they were ruling some other nation. They had fallen away from the ways of God. They did not follow the precepts that God had set before them. In the southern kingdom, they were a little better at doing that. In the northern kingdom, they had at this point already fallen to the Assyrians. The Assyrians were a group that were further east, and they just took over the northern kingdom. In the south, they were about to be taken over by the Babylonians. The threat was there. And oftentimes it was said that this taking over this, these aggressors that came into the countries of Israel and Judah were done because they had fallen away from the grace of God. And part of what Isaiah and the other prophets were all about was God speaking through them. They became chosen vocal cords for Jesus. When they knew Jesus was talking to them, they would say things that Jesus, or Jesus, that God had been telling them, even to personal detriment. Not a lot of the things they said were things that people liked to hear. And that is oftentimes the case when you are the voice of God. You're saying things that are not pro-people, at least not their ideology. But they were caught, to some degree, to what the prophets were telling them. And, and Isaiah 
the, the, the middle section of the one that I was telling you about was called actually, that section was called the book of the servant because he spent a lot of time talking about Jesus, prophesying about this coming person that was going to take the role of a servant. But he promised in there that this, and the other prom prophets promised that this time was going to bring back a leader, a, a person that was going to be unifying for them, or at least that's what the Israelites thought. And they got very hooked up into that thinking because as things got worse and as the northern kingdom was taken over and the threat of uh, Babylon was coming to take them over, the people became very worried. But they were also thinking they had the future was assured because they knew that God's word was a, sh a thing to hold on to. But in that thinking, they lost their way. And I think that's true for us today. There is a lot of parallels that we can give to the Israelites and the people of today. We are living in a world where the political sphere is falling apart in many ways. There's a lot of strife. There's a lot of strife in the social atmosphere of things that people are just not getting along. We're not having so much of a threat of somebody taking over the United States, but we have things like China that loom over, Russia who's got these bombs that could do things, and we've, we've gone through and dealt with them. And it's living like living back in the 60s and 70s again during the Cold War in some ways. So there's a lot of things that make us fearful about living in the world today. Things that make us wonder where we are. I think for Christians though, we have this hope of a new future. That we are promised a seat in heaven. And we get thinking about that. With the Israelites, they were so thinking about their future and the promises that God had made that they forgot where they were at. Their darkness was so great that they were looking forward in the future and seeing much like those golfers, they saw the flag and went ahead and played their game anyway. But not realizing the problems that they were dealing with right around them, not being able to see. The Israelites couldn't deal with the reality that they were in today, in that day. And I think that's true for us today, too. We get so focused on all the things that are around us that we forget where we are. Part of this scripture this morning, and I think you'll see where I'm going, well, is telling us that we need to put our focus off the world and back onto God. In Isaiah verses 6 and 7, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and their unrighteousness their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon there are four key words in that section. Seek, call, forsake, and turn. And if there are English teachers out there, you will know that there is something similar about each of those words. That those words fall into a particular group of words and they're verbs, but not only verbs, they are action verbs. They make the feel of those verses what they are, a call to action. To focus less on the world and more on where we are at. 
to worry less about where we will be and where we are at spiritually, and to do less thinking and more acting on that. A great wise man once said to his mentee, a Jedi must have the deepest commitment, the most serious mind. All his life, he's referring to his mentee, he has looked away to the future, to the horizon, never his mind on where he is at. Now, some of you may know who said that line. It comes from Yoda, who also said some other great things like, judge me by my size to you. But his words were for his mentee, his Padawan, and it was to take the focus off the future and be aware of where you're at right now. And those are the same words that Isaiah is talking to us about. That don't focus on all of these other things. Realize the state you are in and do something about it. Just had the thought of a frog who's sitting in a, a, uh, some water, and as you slowly turn it up, you've heard that analogy before, that frogs can adjust to the temperature until it's too late. And then their dinner. And that's a little bit of the analogy for us. Hopefully we won't be dinner for somebody, but we do need to focus on where we are right now. God has things all the time to help us grow. He is constantly working on us. There is issues that come about and it, we need to focus on those things that he, what it is that he is trying to tell us. When we're dealing with things, we need to focus on what is it that God is trying to tell me about me in this? I need to know. But oftentimes these are things that are weaknesses we have anyway. And we know that God has done this throughout the ages because he certainly did that with Moses. Moses, who had a stuttering tongue, was made to be the voice of God for the people of Israel. A weakness became his strength with God. David, who had his own issues, was the king and became the beloved son of God who God loved. And the leader of his people, probably one of the best that they had ever had. And then there were people like Peter, who was known for being the man who had denied Jesus. But yet he became the cornerstone. Each one of these people had moments where God or Jesus or somebody worked on them and helped them through whatever the issues were so they could become who they needed to be. No weakness would get in the way. But it required them to be willing and to be aware, to do these things that Isaiah is talking about this morning. Knowing where we are is the key. But while doing that calling on the Lord, while doing that calling on the Lord is important. Focusing on him and not ourselves. Because that is what sin wants us to do. Sin doesn't want us to focus on God. He wants us to focus on whatever is going on around us. And he certainly has been working on me and this last few weeks, focusing on all the things that have piled up before I went on this trip. And it's a struggle when you have all of the things that are going on. And I did lose it a little bit yesterday. I had a moment where I just couldn't take, my bandwidth was down to zero, and I had to call someone and just say, I am at the end, called my mentor. I said, I just can't do another thing. But God 
having to do this sermon was part of God saying, I needed you to focus on me. Because you're focused on all of the things that are around you. We often get this idea in our head that we are going to heaven and that things are set for us. That we don't have to worry about anything else because God has the Bible full of promises and that's where talking about promises becomes an issue because it takes our focus off of him sometimes, off of God. We think about the things that he said and not on him and what he's trying to do for us. And sure, the things that, is, that are in the scripture are important for us to do, but if it's not right from God at that particular moment, if that's not what God is focusing on you, then it can be a distraction. Yep, sometimes scripture can be a distraction. We focus on what we want to focus on and not what God wants us to focus on. Sometimes as Christians, we get thinking that we have it already in the bag. That there is nothing that we have to worry about because we're making it to heaven. We think more about the fact that we have been promised to be sitting at the right hands of God and we think we're kings already when we should be focusing on that king who made it that we could be who we are. We need to point towards God and to Jesus in everything we do. Not in ourselves. And this is the trap that the Israelites were in. They got to the point where they were so caught up into the, what the world was going on around them that they were not pointing to God anymore. They were pointing towards themselves. Jesus, they forgot that Jesus wasn't coming just for them. This shadowy figure that's been promised in the prophets was not coming just for them, but he was coming for all the people of the world. He was just starting with the Jewish people. They were the beginning of something great. They weren't the culmination. And that's what they forgot. He wanted to restore all of creation, not just the Jewish people. But to this day, many even today still think that they are just coming, that God is still coming back just for them. But we're not a whole lot different from that, are we? We often think about ourselves more than we think about others. Because in thinking and focusing towards what God wants, he would want us to be servants to those around us. Isaiah says, seek the Lord, call on him, forsake your ways, and turn to him. Notice that those are in a particular order. It doesn't say, turn to him first and then seek him. Or turn to him first and then call on him. The, the turning is the last thing in the process. There is a reason why that is the way it is. You first need to seek God. You first need to find where your true north is. And when you figure out that God is who God is supposed to be and you are focused on him, then you call on him. You know God is the one that you need, so then you call on him. And when you do that, then you forsake all that you are for him. Because we are a sinful and broken people. And then when we've done all that, then it says turn. And why might you think that is the way that is? There's a reason. Remember, 
Earlier this year, I was doing the sermons on Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and all of those. And in those early books, there was the beginning of the book. It said that the, the temple had been, not the temple, the tabernacle had been built for God. God wanted this tabernacle to be built so that he could be with his people. He wanted to be restored and live amongst his people. And when he had Moses build this tabernacle to the specifications, he said, fine, you did a great thing. And Moses said, I'm going to come in. And when he tried to come in at the beginning of the book, God said, no, not yet. And in Leviticus, I think I said numbers last time, didn't I? It's Leviticus. Leviticus is the book about the Levites, and that was the one where they set up all of the things. I think that's what I did the sermon on. I said numbers in the last church, and I don't think it was. I think it was Leviticus. But anyway, Leviticus had started off in the book and said Moses tried to enter, and God said no. By the end of the book, God said you can come in now, and Moses was allowed to enter the tabernacle. But first, what happened was in between all of those, what had happened was that God said, these are the things you need to do to restore yourself. You don't just turn to me first and expect that I'm going to live with you without getting rid or finding a way to get rid of that sin that's part of who you are. Because I am the Lord your God, and I am holy. I can have no darkness, no sin in me. You who live in sin and you who live in darkness need to get rid of that if you want to commune with me. And really, that is a good thing. We don't want a God who's going to let sin come into his presence because then he wouldn't be holy. He wouldn't be the God of love that we want him to be. So that is the reasoning and the, the theology behind all of this is that we need to get rid of the sin. We need to focus on him. We need to forsake all the things that are broken about us. All the things that are sinful about us. We need to get rid of that. And when we do, we find that we can be in the presence of who God is. We can enjoy who he is to the fullest. When that happens, then the holy of holies that were in that tabernacle can be entered by the priests. And when Jesus came, he said, no longer do we need the Holy of Holies because the Holy of Holies with the, the coming of Jesus and his death and dying on the cross will now be set up in our hearts. They will be in our hearts. For those who choose to believe, you can set up a residence for God in your heart. This leads us to verses 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither your ways my ways, declare the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. That tells us that God is different than us. He is special. One of the first things I learned in my class that I took in college for philosophy many years ago was that we all walk a, a path of faith. We don't use logic in that walk. Logic will not get you from A to B on the pathway of faith. When you come to a point where it is trusting God Logic, anything human, will not get you there. Science, human theology, 
None of those things will get you from A to B. Only faith. Because faith is higher. It's based on who God is, and it's part of God's ways. And they're higher than our ways. We do not understand God's ways. Because of that, why? It, because it makes it easier to understand why God would send his son to earth. Because who would send their own son to die for a stranger? Why would God send his son to die for us? Unless he was following something that we just didn't, don't understand. Which is part of why we are so caught up into the sin and brokenness of our world. And we need to follow those four steps to push back that darkness. This leads me to where I want to go, and I won't spend a whole lot of time here, but we are in this darkness. We are so focused on what is going on around us, and we are so caught up in our sin that we need God to change, to help us, to guide us. Without that guidance, we're just in the darkness, lost. And this leads me to a couple verses that I didn't have Russ read for you because I wanted to save the big reveal for the end. It says you, this is verses 12 and 13, and it says you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst forth into song. This is coming after what I previously had read for you. After this call to action, this is what Isaiah is saying. The mountains and the hills will burst forth into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of thorn bushes, there will be junipers. Instead of briars, the myrtle will grow, and, this, and will be the Lord's, this will be the Lord's renown for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. We don't want thorn bushes and briars. That's not a good thing to have growing. But God says, turn to him and the thorn bushes will be turned to junipers, which have a, a value. And the briars will be turned to myrtle, which will have a value. The things that we see around us don't feel like they are anything good. But God has a plan. Seek him. Call on him. Forsake all that we have, and then turn. We need to remember those four action verbs. Then we realize we're in that darkness. We understand how to get out of it. We become wiser in the ways that God wants us to be. And guess what we're doing? We're looking at God not ourselves. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, I thank you for each person here, and I pray that you be with them. Help them to focus on who you are. Be with them in this time and in this week, and I thank you for your presence here this morning, dear Lord. I pray that you, your spirit, continue to work on the lives of these people. Make them be for you the things that glorify you. In this, your precious name, amen.
I'm going to need a volunteer to help me with communion when it comes time. So if somebody feels particularly touched to be a, a help to me, uh, besides my usual helpers, I rely on them an awful lot. Uh, somebody feel free to, when I need it, uh, step up. I appreciate that. Let's stand. Praise God from whom all blessings, Lord. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy. Dear Lord, I thank you for your presence here this morning. I thank you for these gifts that were given to you. I ask that you use them in the furthering of your commitment to us and the bringing of your kingdom to this earth. I thank you, dear Lord, for all that you are. In your precious name, amen. Now, if you turn to page 467, trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way while we do good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows, for the joy he bestows, are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Now you may be seated. If there's somebody out there that could assist me with this, I would greatly appreciate it. Turn to your hymnal to the great thanksgiving.
The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, the one who has given us all things, who's led us from the darkness, who's given us a path to follow from the darkness. We thank you for all that you've done for us. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, By the baptism of his suffering and death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from the slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. And on that night which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and gave thanks to you and broke the bread. gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the pot and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Becky, this is the body broken. In the United Methodist Church, it's important to realize one thing, that we have an open table, that in this open table that all are welcome. You do not have to be a believer. You just have to be willing to open yourself to the walk of Jesus Christ and to experience Jesus Christ. And with that, uh, feel free to come as you're able. 
If there's somebody who's not able to come, please let us know who that is, and then we can take the communion to them. shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. 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 shed for you. Blood of Christ 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 shed for you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we ask that you be with us, especially now as we are about ready to partake of food. We ask that you bless the food to our body. But dear Lord, I ask that you be with those 
that are here this morning, that you bless them, keep them in your ever-loving care. Wherever they go, whatever they do, work on them, continue to work on them. Help them to continue to choose you in all that they do. Amen. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? Justice, kindness, walk humbly with your God. To seek justice and love kindness, and walk humbly with your God to seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly